built by technicians for technicians. A motto that truly drives CPS products to create quality tools that truly meet the demands of its customers. CPS Automotive specializes in air conditioning, service tools and equipment, engine performance, diagnostics, also in fluid management. We train on every machine that we sell. We go out and we want that customer to make money on the first job that he does. Its customers know when they're using CPS, they've got the right tool for any job. Hey guys, and welcome to Repair University Live. If you haven't noticed, uh, summer came a little bit early uh, to Arkansas. It's and so hot. Yeah, one of these days I'm going to put air out here, right? Yeah. Um, we may have to start a GoFundMe account for me to have air conditioning. Um, but we do appreciate you guys logging on an hour early so that these guys didn't have to be out here at noon in a metal building without thank air conditioning you. doing a show. So they thank you. Yes, um, yes, and I thank you. thank you. And how fitting that today we're going to talk about air conditioning Absolutely. is one of the things that we're going to Perfect. cover, right? Um, yep. We are learning the benefits of it. So real quick, we got a, a new way for you guys for sending in your questions. Um, you can text us. The phone number is on the screen for texting. Um, that way your questions come right in. You don't have to worry about typing them in on the show, being on a desktop or whatever. Just uh, whip out your phone, use your old texting, send any of your questions to us right now. Uh, well, maybe later when we cover a little bit. Maybe not right now. Yeah. Um, but we would love to hear from you. So guys, let's get started. First of all, CPS, thank you guys for joining us. Thanks for well, having us. I appreciate us. For having, to be here. Um, sure. having some experts yeah. um, on the show because these, these guys. Experts. Wow. Not, not, not an expert. <laughs> they, uh, Definitely not an expert. <laughs> Those uh, ICAR guys. Yeah. 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 Those poor <laughs> ICAR guys, right? Um, we're going to get through. So we're going to talk about two systems of cooling today. So there's really two to look at, right? There's the passenger cooling and there's the engine cooling. Um, but both of them are kind of smushed up front, right? Um, and we've got a lot of stuff, uh, of smushed. a lot of extra stuff on the front of cars these days, right? We've got uh, active grill shutters. Um, there's extra sensors there now. Transmission coolers. Trans coolers. Yep. I mean, all kinds of things in that small space protected by a small plastic bumper cover. Um, so they can fit it in, they're going to put it right? there. Right. So just about every collision you work that's a front end collision is probably going to be affected by um, these components. They're going to be involved in some way or another, so a great thing to do it. We're going to spend most of our time today focusing on the AC. It is the one that we kind of see some of the most struggles with in the body shops, um, and we'll go through them. So guys, just real quick, what are some of the common damaged items in the in the cooling system, passenger cooling, and a front-end collision? What are we going to be looking at? Condensers well, or radiators? Well, let's just start right up front. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. It's going to happen with your condenser, and then your radiator right behind it, the cooling right. fans all sitting in there. Connection. You got the lines. In this particular car, the evaporator is actually contained inside of here with an access point below. So any frontal collision has an opportunity to damage these systems. And then, of course, if we take a part or we're going to replace a core support or something like that, all that stuff's got to come out and then come back in. Right. So all that stuff applies. Now, lines, right? Are they necessarily um, straightenable? No. Right. So it's a different material. It's not something that we're going to pull and straighten. And yeah. Because we're and holding that, pressure on those lines, right? Not to go crazy with a line, but it's right here. And so how air conditioning works is it works on expansion. And so if you bend the line, it creates a restriction, which then causes the freon Absolutely. or the refrigerant. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I know, yep. I know, uh -huh. I'm just kind of like saying glue and adhesive, I know. But it, it, it causes an additional expansion point, which will cause it to not function properly. So right. any bend at all, even if you try and straighten it back out, I mean, try and straighten out a, a, a copper pipe. If it wasn't designed to be that way, <laughs> then change it. Yeah, it has to be right. changed. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's not something we're going to, we're not going to put that on the frame rack and straighten that out, right? right? So let's talk about the appraisal portion of this. So we've got a vehicle that's coming in. Obviously, this is the one that we had from the blueprinting show. Um, and we got to this point and stopped with our teardown process because we knew you guys were coming yeah. in the next month, so it worked out really well. Um, but as an estimator, one of the first things I kind of have to decide, right, when I walk up to a system and see damage is I call it open or closed, mm -hmm. but you guys kind of explain it to Pre me a little differently. Pressurized or not pressurized. If it's got air conditioning, if it's got refrigerant in it, then it's going to be under pressure. Uh, if it has no refrigerant, then it's open. It's, it, it's, right. it's void of refrigerant and it's got air and moisture. Right. Gotcha. What are some of the cool. things that an estimator can do to kind of assess that situation? 
to decide whether it's open or closed. Well, one one thing they can do is uh, if they have a, a UV light handy, they can uh, they can I inspect just the have a UV light handy. They can inspect the system with a UV light, and they can look for telltale signs of dye coming out of the system. Most manufacturers do put dye in the system from the from the manufacturer from the factory. Right. Okay. Um, all but Toyota. So uh, now we've got a little bit. I know it's going to be hard for the camera to see it, but we've got yeah. a little bit of. Right here, we've got a few little signs popping up. So, would right. we consider this an open system? Uh, we, we, if we see if we see a die coming out, absolutely, you're going to consider it an open system, and uh, you're going to handle it accordingly. You know you're going to have to change the desiccant. Uh, you know you're going to have to refill the system. Obviously, uh, at this point, if it is open, you can go ahead and start disassembly without recovering and recycling the refrigerant. Well, and a caution on that, yeah, because just because you see die. Doesn't mean there's no Doesn't pressure. mean there's not pressure. Correct. That's a good point. Because you know it could be from some other thing, or you know a, a time right. before it was repaired. So chances could are be a it small probably leak is not too. under pressure. Yeah. It could be a small leak. Right. So we want to pay attention to that. The one thing we don't do is we don't walk up, pop the cap, and press the button. We don't right. do that. All right. We'll talk more about the leak. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh come on. We teach that in estimating school, right? Keep a small <laughs> screwdriver, eyeglass screwdriver with you. Pop it. You know, turn your head. That was all you had to do. Yeah. And you were good to go. Um, but you know, as the slide shows, you also can sometimes see, see not oil. only just you'll see some oil, you'll see that discoloration on the condenser itself, and you'll right. know that that system's open. So let's talk a little bit more about why that matters. So you kind of mentioned it a little bit, but why does it matter if the system's open or closed when I'm in the appraisal process at this okay, point? Okay, so if it's closed, there's additional work that's going to have to be done uh, to the system. Number one, you have to hook up. First of all, you got to have certified, trained technicians. Uh, secondly, you have to have a, a machine that's going to recover that refrigerant, and then you have to go through the refrigerant recovery process, or you farm out the job. Now, you know, a lot, lot of dot body shops now are doing their own mechanical work, which is a good thing. So, but you have to have those things, and that's additional time and it's additional money uh, out of your pocket to, to to do the service. To do all that. So that YouTube and video that shows the guy just letting it off in the atmosphere. That's not. It's uh, illegal, right? Yeah, it's yeah. illegal. Yeah, yeah. and then there's so we're going to talk about that, but yeah. there are fines involved. Yeah. yeah. Now we learned uh, through talking with you guys yesterday. I think I'm going to admit it. I, I haven't done it, right? My career, um, Scott. I think you and I talked about mm -hmm. as many cars as we fixed. So we're like, I didn't do that, right? Yeah. So the deck is deck decacent. That's a Yeah. All right. It's close. <laughs> Explain that a little bit to me, um, and that it's kind of maybe more than just the silica packs that I'm used to not eating in my shoes, yeah. right? So, so a desiccant, it comes in a small, a small bag and it sits inside the air conditioning system where it collects moisture that's carried by the refrigerant in the system. And it, it has so much capacity. When the system is open, moisture is able to get in and it achieves that capacity a lot faster. That's why we say if it's open, go ahead and just replace the desiccant. In the case of what we're looking at here, uh, the desiccant uh, bag, is contained in the uh, in the, accu the built-in accumulator, a, if you will. There's a cylinder that's in here that's accessed from the bottom. Right. So in order to replace that, we have to get access to that, come up through here, uh, and replace the part. Okay. Right. So in this instance, on this vehicle, just replacing the condenser alone would take care of that. But if I had another system like Illustrated where that accumulator was in another position on the car, correct. then that's going to be a required additional part to replace. Right. Yeah. Uh, when I'm writing the estimate, correct? Because in, yeah. in most cases, that desiccant isn't available to be serviced separate from correct. the accumulator. Right. So whether it's a receiver dryer or an accumulator, same, same, same thing. You've got desiccant in there that's going to need to be replaced. Right. And even, in fact, Mitchell, um, in their guide to estimating, calls it out. So there's an, if you go into the air conditioning R&R, yep. &R, it'll tell you that if the system's been open. Um, and we kind of debated that a little bit. And it, we looked at a couple of different sources and it came back basically saying about 24 hours, if the system's open 24 hours, then that's going to generate that uh, necessity. I can't think of a car I ever got to the shop that I got to it in under 24 hours. You got it capped off. Like, yeah. right, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. right from the yeah. accident. So, yeah. I mean, that's just... Uh, yeah, I mean, if we took, if we took this out and this, was, and this was a closed system to where we actually you know, recovered the, the refrigerant and then we capped the lines off with a water balloon or something mm -hmm. airtight, watertight, we're going to be okay. But if this thing's been hit and it got towed and do a tow yard overnight and et cetera, we're going to wind up having to replace that. Right. Right. Yep. Now, now guys, Great. what's the issue with, I mean, I can, I can hear the argument already, right, from the person that comes into the shop that goes, wait, I don't want to pay for that, mm -hmm. right? What, what happens when that system gets moisture in it and we don't replace it in, in that 
Decason. De- Decason. Okay. Yeah. So mo- moisture. We'll, we'll get you there. <laughs> yeah. Moisture, and, and Josh, you can chime in as well. But yeah. do, moisture interacts with the refrigerant. It degrades the oil, and it also interacts with the refrigerant in such a way that it can create acid. Acid in the inside of the AC system is going to corrode. It's going to damage the compressor. It's not good for yeah. the inside. What, what's the most expensive component in that system? Compressor. The compressor. compressor. Yeah. Mo- moisture in the in the oil going to take out your compressor. Right. So the other thing that's going to happen, though, if you get enough moisture in your desiccant, the likelihood that it's going to start circulating through the system because it expands as it absorbs moisture, now that desiccant is traveling through the system. It's going to plug up the, the condenser. It's going to make its way to the com- compressor. It's going to take out your compressor. It may make its way to the evaporator. I mean, you're, now you've got an entire system failure because you didn't replace the desiccant. An easy way to think about it is like there a diaper. Go. Yeah. You fill it full of water and it gets bigger, and it, right? And it well. yeah. Same yeah. principle. Not that there's a yeah. diaper in there. And when the diaper's <laughs> full, yeah, the diaper's full, it's a leaking. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. So really, I mean, it's it's it speeds up the wear and tear on our customer. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many of us, let's go back to our tech days, had a customer that comes in maybe, we fix the car, maybe first of winter, summer comes along, they come in, the car's not working. The, they tell us it's the compressor, and we go, hey, we didn't work on the compressor, right? Right. I mean, I, I think I've had probably three or four of those conversations just as an adjuster, right? And the customer yep. calls back, and I, I maybe didn't think that through. I might have owed some claims there uh, that I weren't well, thinking of. And well, when, and, well, here's what's typical in the in the real world is, okay, so you re, it's winter, yeah. you recharge the air conditioner, the thing works through about June or July, but now that you're using it every day, like in Arkansas right now, you would be, and then, and now, well, if we had it, we'd be using it. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and over time, it stops working. So then they bring it back to you, and the first thing most shops do is they hook the machine up, they recover it, they recycle it, and they recharge it, and it works. And then six months later, it stops working again. That's a right. uh, that's that that accumulator receiver dryer is saturated. Yeah. Well, and I think that's one of the things that a lot of technicians uh, misunderstand is that. You just pull a vacuum, get the moisture out of it that way, but if that desiccant is overfilled, yep. you can't pull all that moisture out. Yep. Right. So that's where you get that recurring problem. Yep. Right. So the, I've been a tech for 30 years, and all i got to do is do an extra 20 minutes on the vac. That doesn't do it, Scott? No, it doesn't quite cut it. <laughs> all of my 30-year yep. hacks aren't working anymore. No. Nope. Right? <laughs> well, now that we Operative word there is hack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make that my middle name. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, I need to get some hack shirts made. Kristen uh, Hack Felder. Yeah, there you go. I like that. <laughs> Supporting hackers everywhere. Um, all right, so I've identified my system open or closed. From there, I've probably, as an estimator, identified additional components maybe that will be required to be replaced right. as part of this repair. But now i got to identify the material. So what am I working with here? And, and guys, that's where CPS really comes in handy yep. for me because you have a yep. lot of options besides labels for me. Well, there's two, two primary refrigerants in our car park today, R134A, which is has been there since 1994. Uh, and now we have r 1234 yf coming in since 2013. And it will be in every car in the United States by 2021. So get ready for it. It's really coming. It's not a short-term refrigerant. It's really, you're gonna, de- you're gonna deal with it and you're gonna see them pretty quickly if you're not already seeing them today. So um, you can see the, the label for YF is unique. It's different according to the, the SAE J639 standard. It has to be uh, has to have certain warnings, etc. It is a mildly flammable refrigerant. It is very expensive, and it requires more time to do the service. Not just the recovery recycling, but also the charging. It's a, it just count on an extra 15 minutes to, to put refrigerant in the system because of the process you have to go through. Um, the other thing you think about is if the if the um, evaporator is damaged in the in the accident. The evaporator has to meet a current SAE standard. Because it's a mildly flammable refrigerant, we don't want that flammable refrigerant getting loose in the passenger compartment for obvious reasons. So no smoking when you're working with the system either? Probably not a good idea. Got it. No but, welding but next to it? But that's no. true around cars <laughs> anyway. I mean, we do work around gas, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now, but the, but the other mildly thing is, though, just yeah. because <laughs> the label no, says 1234YF or 134A, that doesn't mean that's necessarily because you know a lot of people will grab the adapter yep. and they'll put whatever's in there to make it work. 
Now, if there's something in there that's not that, and we put it into the machine, that's going to be a problem. That'll be a problem. Yeah, cross contamination is a problem. So what do we do? So, um, to, to, uh, very good question. So, uh, as part of the SA and SAE anticipated this, as well as the as the EPA, because cross contamination is illegal mm -hmm. uh, per their law. So what they did is said, okay, so the new standard is there has to be a refrigerant identifier built into the equipment when you buy it today. So you, when you're hooking up a car today, you, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to identify that refrigerant and tell you whether it's 100% R134A, 100% YF, and if or it is- Or something different. Or, or something different. If it's something different, it, it won't allow the, the machine to go forward. It will not recover, and you will avoid the cross-contamination issue. Now, one of the things I like about you guys, and the reason you're here, is that you actually have a lot of solutions when it comes to those tools, right? right? So I have a lot of shops now going, oh my God, I gotta buy a whole other machine, but you guys make a machine that'll really do both for me, is that right? Hey, how about that? Yeah, we, we, it's our FX3030, and yes, it does, uh, it does R134A and R1234YF, and the switch time is very minimal, it's 10 minutes to go from one gas to the other. So for shops looking to, to just have you know, one machine do it all, that's, that's now, what's the solution? Just so I've identified, let's say I've identified my material, and I'm still we're still estimators. So I want to make sure everybody's really clear. We're still in the estimating stage. No technician has touched the car yet. We're into identifying. If we did have to hook up, obviously, yeah, I got to have a tech for that. But how about how many pounds of refrigerant would the average sedan or, or vehicle hold? So nowadays it's getting it's getting smaller as we go forward, but it's anywhere between. 11 ounces and two and two pounds or which was yeah so well, if you actually look at the label that yeah. we just showed on the screen it's right. one pound yeah. one pound there yeah. you go and then what is that so the new yf what does that cost me per pound um it's anywhere from 80 dollars to 110 depending on where you buy it so i'm potentially <laughs> recharging a system right now as an estimator i'm looking at per pound at 200 dollars of material extra line item added to the absolutely estimate. Absolutely. And if it was 134A, what, what would that Three be? Three bucks a pound. Three bucks a pound. Yeah. Wow. So if you miss that one, no big deal. But if you miss 80 bucks a pound, yeah. uh, you're, you're eating it. Yeah. yeah. Now, what cars are we seeing the YF on right now? Um, so Fiat Chrysler, uh, since, night, since 2013, they've been uh, going. Uh, Ford is now about 50%. Uh, General Motors will be 100% by the end of this year. Jaguar, you know, Land Rover, I mean, the, across the board, uh, the Japanese companies are, are moving in that direction. Well, as and these are the cars our audience is fixing right yeah. now. Right, exactly. These cars are in those shops right now. Right. Yep. So, from a Part machine standpoint, what, what's updated or changed on the machines? Let's say I've got a system I've been having in my shop for 10 years and I've been doing 134A for the last 10 years. Is that machine still good? Sure, with the it loss? Can, it, absolutely. And it can still do R134A, but then that YF system rolls in and now you're okay, what am I going to do now? Now right. you need another system. Right, so if I'm system. definitely looking at blueprinting, I know I have to have these tools in my blueprinting bay, not just in my mechanic bay, then your solution with a yep. dual system is really the way to go. One, one stop we shop and so. one machine. Yeah. And I kind of like it too. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's say I open the hood and it's had a core support replaced in the hood and they didn't put the labels and stuff back on. How would I know as an estimator or a technician, yep. whether it's 134A so or, or yeah. uh, one, two, three, four, why off? Okay, so, well, through refri refrigerant identification, but you can yeah. also look it up. But I'm right? estimating, right? right. So, so you can look it up. There's there's systems that, you know, you can go in, type in the year, make, model, and it'll pull up what kind of refrigerant. That's back to the Is research. The VIN? Yeah. Yeah. Right the yeah. A little research. Yeah. Um, you know, AC machines that, uh, when we make one, that has a database. So you can go to your AC machine, type in the year, make, a model, and it'll tell you what kind of refrigerant's in it, what kind of oil it uses, et cetera. Now, right. do the ports tell us? The ports are different between okay. R134A and R12, so you cannot hook, or excuse me, R1234YF, you can't hook a YF machine up to an R134A car and vice versa. It, it just doesn't allow you to do that. And that's right. by design, because we right. don't want to cross-contaminate. Yeah. All right, so I've got my material identified, but I'm still not done making some, before a technician gets to this car and we start taking parts off. Um, there are concerns maybe with battery disconnect on certain types yeah, of cars? Yeah, so if you see really bright orange cables uh, attached to the uh, com compressor, <laughs> you, you, you be, be aware you're working on a hybrid or an electrified vehicle that uses an electric compressor. So instead of being driven by the belt, it's driven by an electric motor, which is part of the AC system. The refrigerant and oil are actually coming in contact with those windings, right? So uh, what happens if I put something in there that conducts electricity? I can have a short circuit to ground, my car is going to recognize that and say, 
I'm not going to start. I'm not going to allow anything to happen. The other thing is, is before I start tearing things apart, do I really want to get hit with 208 volts? I'm going to say no. <laughs> Probably not. No. So yeah. how, do I, how do I deal with that? Well, it's I disconnect the battery. Yeah. 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 And not, not that battery, not the 12 volt battery, the battery that's in the back, that's the, the big battery pack that's... Well, if you disconnect yeah. the big battery pack, you're also going to probably disconnect the 12. Yeah. And then now we got resets. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All the different yeah. resets and all that. So now we're possibly a dealer trip for an AC recharge to reset ADAS. Or, and, or and maybe a visit to the RTS website to do double check which systems that vehicle has that now need to be reset. Yeah. We actually start our day there. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Every Absolutely. estimate starts yeah. there. Every yeah. estimate starts at the RTS port. Yeah. And, and there are other sensors or things that may be mounted in that yep. general area that if I disconnect those to get the condenser or the radiator out, then I'm now in, I'm down the diagnostic rabbit hole, Absolutely. As, we, as we like to call it. Um, in fact, y'all could just make like a little rabbit that just a, hops a across rabbit the hole? That'd be fantastic. On the website? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, that would just like, you know, like a little... I'll put a word in. Reason, yeah. reason yeah. to we'll come like I mean, I, I like to give tips. Got the I mean, math out cruising through. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> all probably, right. probably no copyright issues there no. at all. So oh, uh, another <laughs> uh, quick thing on electric compressor. So you, you, you've discovered you have an electric compressor. There's, there's other things that, that you got to take into consideration. It's going to take longer for you to charge because uh, there's a requirement under SAE that you have to clean the hoses of the re residual oil that was used in a previous system. So you got to clean that so you don't get a conductive material when you recharge that hybrid system. Because it's a different oil. It is a different oil. It's a POE, uh, polyester oil, and highly... Um, so you're talking about the hoses on the machine. I'm talking you're about not the hoses. cleaning the, the hoses in the vehicle. Correct. You got to clean you, the hose. You got to flush somehow. Correct. Because the, the every hoses time I handle refrigerant, I'm handling oil. Right. Sure. So I don't want to have any residual. And, oil. and guess what? That's not included. It's not included. In any of the time in nope, any of the not. database. And it's another it's five to seven minutes of yeah. time. It's kind of yep. like welder setup in yep. a way. It's, yep. it's equipment setup. It's cleaning. Right. It's getting it ready. It's wear and tear on the equipment. It's a line item, right. you know, that needs to be considered. Yep. And we're on seeing more and more hybrids. I mean, between. You know, Hyundai and Kia and Ford and everybody, there's a lot of people selling kind of a, a, a mild a version of a hybrid. Yep. Yep. Um, as so well as full electric plug-in. Yeah. Guess what? They got electric. It's all electric. Yep. Yeah. They're all the same. So yep. it's all to do. So, all right. Well, guys, I'm at a stopping point now, right? My yep. estimator has taken us as far as we can go with my initial diagnosis. I'm starting, I'm probably up to maybe about 10, 12 lines on the estimate we right now. We haven't looked at the car yet. And we have, yeah, we haven't looked at the car yet, really. But to touch the car, to physically go out and start touching these systems or service them as they say, I got a lot of laws around here. And we consider, and, and I, I was talking to a guy from the EPA, and I said, okay, so if I take this condenser, unbolt it, somebody else has evacuated it and, and recovered and all that, right. and I take that out and I put it back in bolting it, have I quote unquote serviced an AC system? And he yes. said, under what we would look at is, is we would say that you have and therefore you need to be certified to do it. And there's, and we'll talk about some fines right. that, so just your teardown tax and your yep. reassembly tax need to be certified. Right, so um, we got a couple of questions coming in right now. So I wanna go ahead and before we get into the laws, right? Cause we always, that's in a whole other rabbit hole. Yep. Um, so what is the easiest way to check a system for leaks guys? Electronic leak detector is one of the simple That's ways. That's kind of to, a scary to, little yeah, device. <laughs> Come on over here, right, Kristen. Yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. going don't, near that. Don't hide behind me. <laughs> okay, so electronic leak detector is one way, but also UV dye. Most systems are charged with oil and dye. So we showed you earlier using a UV light uh, to go around the system, go around connections, uh, hoses, et cetera, et cetera. Just a quick note on, uh, on uh, leak detection. So this leak detector made by CPS, uh, does both R134A and 1234 YF. When you're checking leaks on 134A, you check on the positive side, on the high, on the high side of the joint, uh, and, and, and either side, when you're doing 1234 YF, YF is much heavier than air and, and falls to the floor. So you wanna be on the bottom side of connections uh, when you're looking at YF leaks. So a tool like that, right? Yeah. So we got UV lights, we showed that a little bit earlier, but a tool like that, what's that gonna run the shop? A couple roughly? hundred bucks. A couple hundred bucks? Yep. And available through a distributor? Yep, okay. absolutely. Map and the, and the light, it's different than the curing lights that are being used Correct. in the industry. It's a, it's different, a different wavelength? Different wavelength. 400. Yeah, I yeah, got to say, because so. when you guys said we are going to do UV testing, I jumped up and went, oh, I got my oh, Tommy yeah. guns. Yeah. Right? And it was like a completely now, different wavelength. I've got a light for that, wavelength. but maybe not. Yeah. Right. So you got to make sure you got the right light. That's Another right. thing to do for yeah. leaks with that, and that's why the, the electronic leak detector versus the UV is much more effective, 
is you can actually put it down through the vents Correct. and detect it where it's leaking out of the evaporator. Yeah. Okay, so another ah. way of, to look for evaporator leaks is run the air conditioning system, yeah. and as it's dripping, yeah. um, if there is dye, so you have dye in the system, if yeah. there's dye in the system, you may be able to pick up UV traces of dye in the water that's sure. dripping out of the box. Oh, on the box, yeah, yeah. So you can yeah. say, oh yeah, I got an evaporator. And, yeah. and use your leak detector at the drain for the case. There you for go. For the same reason. Same reason. That heavier gas may be coming out of the drain. Yep. Yeah, interesting, all right, so, how much additional labor would you add to the standard 1.4 for 134A, which is really what our databases are looking at right now? What yeah. about additional labor do you think uh, is reasonable? Uh, 0 0.25. Yeah. Minimally, 0.25. Yeah. And then the extra cost of the refrigerant, $3 a pound, $80 a pound. Right. And it looks like we got another question down there. What about other refrigerants from Europe? Is there another refrigerant? Well, yes. Uh, our friends at Mercedes are exper and, and, and other German manufacturers are experimenting with and, and have actual live CO2 systems. So CO2 is what we breathe out every day. So they take it, contain it, and they put it into an AC system, and, and, they gen and it is, acts as a pretty good refrigerant. It's not a great refrigerant, but it's a pretty good refrigerant. Now, are those vehicles here in the U.S.? No. No. Okay. There, there's only one uh, that ever made it to the United States. But um, we're, we, we will not see, in the near term, I'd say in the next five to ten years, my personal opinion, my personal opinion, uh, we won't see CO2 cars in the United States. And if we do, we'll do another show. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So, so, this, so right now, I would say, I mean, you're out in the field every day, right? Running around with right. these shops. The shops that are holding out hope that this YF's going to go away and mysteriously disappear, and, and maybe a CO2 or another system's going to come along, is that going to happen? No, as we stated at the start of the show, it's, uh, it's here. Yeah. It's not coming, it's here. Yeah. And it's here to stay. Yeah. So break down, get the machine, you know. Right. All right, so let's go back to the laws, because really that's what kind of started driving this whole thing and the changes and things anyway with some laws. Um, and let's just start first with OSHA. So in the body shop, we have two, um, two governing bodies. They are different, and yep. both of them can fine us. Yeah. So <laughs> um, OSHA. OSHA is basically concerned when it comes to AC work with my eyes, so uh, proper eye protection, mm -hmm. right? With my lungs, because mm -hmm. we talked yesterday that actually if I breathe in that, if I'm not actually draining high the system. High concentrations, yeah. Um, yeah, high well, And the one thing about it is it's not quote unquote toxic, like you know you take a smell, but when you breathe it in, as you said, it's heavier than air. So it's gonna go down into the bottom of your lungs and you're not gonna be able to breathe it out. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, if, if the system starts to go and you take a big gulp of air, it, it can suffocate you. Yeah. Yeah, so all those guys with screwdrivers blowing those lines off with their face over it. Yeah. Good job, <laughs> all right. Yeah. And then hands, right? Skin. So we, yeah. yeah, we need to protect our skin. Stuff's cold. Yeah, yeah, make sure that you've got the right protection there. Yeah. Um, so sometimes t-shirt isn't the best uh, work wear for a Long technician. Um, and then we wanna make sure we have the right gloves um, for that. Um, other than that, that's really about OSHA. That's all OSHA really has to say about it. Other than just make sure you're safe. Trip hazards, yeah. wires, those kind of things. But the EPA has a lot to say about this. Mm -hmm. um, so let's walk through this new, this federal standard, the Clean Air Act, right? It's not new. It's been here since it's 1992. Not, what? Do you mean it's not new? Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, so it started with the Montreal Protocol, and then we adopted it as, as, as Section 608 and 609 of the Clean Air Act yep. uh, back in the early 90s when we went from R12, if you guys remember R12, Freon, uh, to R134A. So we've been on R134A since 1992, and these laws have been in effect. But Let's say you've lost, you, you got certified in 1998, but you lost your card. Now you want to go buy some R1234YF and they go, show me your card. Can't buy it. Uh, EPA guy comes in and says, hey, I see you're working on that AC system. Show me your card. Yep. Oh, what card? Oh, yeah, I got that back in 1998. No, no, no. Where's your card? Yep. So if you, if, you, if you got certified before, but you don't have your card, get certified again. Yeah, normally what they'll do is they send you your certificate yeah. and the corner of it is your card. Yeah, there you go. So, and it's, this is kind of like your driver's license. You can't drive without your driver's license or they'll fine you. Right, right. Yep. Same thing, if you can't work on an AC without your card present. Right, so well, as a technician, just go, get certified. <clears throat> if you're gonna be touching an AC system, spend the few minutes and the few dollars. Yeah, get so, certified. The, so that Clean Air Act actually requires that the technician in the shop be certified. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a simple test. It's an open book test. It's 20 bucks, right? It's, it doesn't get much easier than that. Yeah. Now, what happens a lot of times is the technicians um, kind of play this, um, 
um, Duck Duck Goose, Goose Game, where they just cycle around shops in town, right? So the time you got it, you walked in your boss's office and threw it on his desk and said, hey, here I am. And you went to the sh next shop two years later and you didn't take any of that paperwork with you. Right. Um, so right now you're exposed. There's not like a database where somebody, it's not like you're hunting and fishing license, right? right. So right now, right. Um, I go out and I get caught fishing and I can't find my license. The game and fish officer they can look, can look it up, right? Yep. This isn't how this works. No. So if you don't physically have the certificate in your hand, I don't think a lot of shops know that. Right. You need to make sure every technician in your shop physically has their card um, and is legal. Or their wow. certificate, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. want to wear that big collision repair grade ahead again now? No, no okay. I'm, I'm, still, right. I'm still going to pass. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but now it goes to the machine too, right? Yeah, so not so only does my techs have to be certified, yeah. my machines. So your shop needs to own a piece of equipment that is written into the Section 609, meets an SAE standard that, that's written into 609. So, um, you know, so in the United States, as manufacturers in the United States, we have to, we can't sell a machine that is not SAE certified. So make sure when you're looking at that Chinese unit, uh, I'm pretty much guaranteeing it's not SAE certified. Right. So. Now, you guys provide a letter that goes with the machine, correct? Yes, correct. So, uh, yes, and, and that letter, you fill out the pertinent information, you send it into the, your local EPA regional office. We even list all of the regional offices to make it easy for you uh, to get that information to them. And then they have it on file that you have a certified piece of equipment. Therefore, you can do air conditioning work. And now, a, check your state regulations, too. California, some others have some additional, additional uh, regulations. And there's a couple so. things on that form, because yeah. it's not just the piece of equipment. You're also declaring, for lack of a better way to say it, that you are doing AC service Correct. and you have technicians that are servicing AC systems. So if an EPA agent walks they into your know shop, where to look for they, yeah, they, they already know where <laughs> yeah. to look. Because yeah. they know you, because yeah. you have to tell them you are. Right. Yeah. So that form does have to be on file with the EPA. So my best recommendation to the shops that we work with is to send that as a certified letter to that local EPA office, right? So there's a copy of it for you and your files to always have, and then there's a copy of when you send it certified so that if the EPA inspector comes in and goes, wait, you never notified us of this piece of machinery, it is paperwork, it is the government. Um, so I at least want to back up that says, no, I mailed it to you certified, and here's the day you signed for it, blah, 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 and I've got a backup in my file. Yeah. So never, like, and if you go to like the EPA everything website, else in our industry, right. documentation is important. Yeah. Right? Everything. Yeah, CYA. So if you go to the EPA website, they actually detail exactly what they need, mm -hmm. and they give you a little form to, you know, I don't even know if it's a form, but basically here's what we need and send it here, and yep. it's pretty yeah. straightforward. Yeah, and I will say, Mark, I don't know about you when you're consulting, but I, this is probably one of the things that, is not done it's you know we buy done. the right machine and we're pretty good about making sure we're getting the right machine to some extent we're pretty good about making sure we got a certified tech but i don't think officially <coughs> notifying the epa of our purchase is something that that we're doing yeah, and, so. and also we look at the uh, from the mso standpoint where you know the mso's they'll buy a shop Buck. yeah and is that machine actually registered you know the mso might register the stuff they buy new but the stuff they shops they bought is it registered right, right. so cool. something to look right. at yep, yep something to think about yep. now yep. there also are some rules on substitute materials so talk to me a little bit about what that is and what the epa is looking for there um just not being able to change out yeah substitute so the it's, called, it's called the snap rule it's the okay. significant new alternatives policy is what it stands for wow and, okay yeah Simple. exactly yeah, simple. yeah. 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 It's, another acronym. it's the government i'm yeah. from the government i'm here to help <laughs> so um anyways what, what it what it is is just a list of uh, refrigerants that can be substituted in a particular system so r12 it, it started with r12 so they listed all the substitutes that you can use in an r12 system now they've got, you know, added to the list, here are some substitutes you can use in an R134A system. And here are the, you know, terms of use. If it's mildly flammable, then you have to do this, 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 and this. So that's what it does. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, not getting it right. And it's a so, lot less expensive, so people put it in. So that's why we want to identify before we there pull you out go. our machine. There right. You go. So if I don't have my certified text, if I don't notify the EPA of my machine, Possible daily fine of what, Mark? Thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars. In fact, when you asked me that yesterday, I said ten grand. Yeah. Because that's what it was, and I looked it up. I went, oh my gosh, inflation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's per, per day. Technician per day. Per tech per day, not per shop per day. Yep. Per tech per. Per day. Per day. Now we've discovered that if I touch the system, if I'm R and I a radiator, a condenser, well, a condenser, sorry. Yep, yep. If I'm R&I a condenser, if I'm touching a line, if I'm going to hook up the machine, 
I have got to have that certification. Mm -hmm. I got to have that card on me. Right. So that means if I'm in a lean process style environment, that's not just my mechanic, right? That's going to be my teardown tech. That's going to be my techs. Mm -hmm. That's going to be my reassembly tech. Yeah, yep. but it's also anybody that's going to be pulling a dash out. It's going to be anybody that's touching a refrigerant line, right? You know, etc. You know, like in Denver, it was I don't know, probably eight or ten years ago, an EPA agent walked in, and this is what they said. You know, the, he walked in as a customer, going, "I don't know about my AC," and what happened was the shop took a screwdriver, <laughs> poked it, and went. Psh, guy pulled out his ticket book, and then the guy started giving him a bad time. He says, "Well, let's walk into your shop." <laughs> And they're like, oh, well, that guy's doing an AC. Where's his card? And then the guy kept on giving him a bad time. He goes, let's pull some closed files. Oh, I mean, this is like, you know, where do we go? Yeah, yeah. it's never, there's another rabbit hole, right? Yep. Oh, for sure. Um, but so. it definitely isn't just, um, just something that you want to have the mechanic in your shop have. It's not just something that the guy that you think is going to be hooking up the machine needs to have. have a record. Realistically, yeah. every, I would have every tech in the shop. Um, it, and to some extent, um, if I'm going to have estimators touch things, I might even get my estimators. Um, there's two ways to get it, right? At least. At least, right? Yeah. So every, every shop that's watching this and every person that's watching this could be certified about two hours from now. Yeah. You End know, it's going to blow up the website at ASC and Max, but right. they could hey, be certified. I'd like that. Yeah. That would make me happy, right? <laughs> so you can go it's to the ASC to website. It's approximately $20. It's an open book test. You take the test, you get certified. Mm -hmm. Print off your certificate. You print your certificate right then and there, fold yep. it up, put it in your toolbox, Good staple to it next to your desk, do whatever you got. But we can also get to that on the Max website, right? Same right. thing. I think they're $19. So, you know, if you want to save a dollar, Either right? Way. Um, Either but way. same thing, you're going to take the same test. When you're done, you're going to print off your certificate. Standardized test. And yeah. you're good to go. But that way, <coughs> There's never a question, right? Mm -hmm. We had a presentation um, from an OSHA rep at CIC yep. out in Denver yep. um, that the body shop business is a renewed interest for not only just the EPA, but OSHA as well now. So um, we're, we have a more uh, a sense of uh, potential for mm -hmm. them to come and visit us. They're paying attention. Um, yeah. They are. Um, and while they may be walking through to maybe pay a new heightened sense of awareness to the paint booth, well, they're not going to miss anything they might happen well, to walk They're walking through going, oh, where's this card? It's pretty uh, low-hanging fruit, really. Right. Yeah, right. exactly. And just one thing to note, this test that, again, 20 bucks, open yep. book, you can, you can have it done in an hour or two, you'll be, you'll, and you'll have it behind you. It's lifetime. Yeah. As long as you hold on to the credential. Don't lose your card. It doesn't expire. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's... there's no reason not to. Yeah, right. best best twenty buck advan um, that you can take. Just as a technician, remember that you are welcome to hop about the industry <laughs> and change jobs. Just make sure that that's a credential you take with you mm -hmm. when right. you go. Right. right. It's your credential. Um, it's your now that's federal, but as you mentioned, there are some states where there may be additional requirements based on those state laws. Count on it in California. Yeah, count on everything in California. Um, if it can be difficult, California's They'll written no legislation yep. for it. Right. Yep. Um, and then but, all the other states look at California and go, that's a good idea. That's yeah. a great idea. But you mentioned something about, like, was it Wisconsin or Indiana that also has some? Well, Wisconsin used to have some additional laws around air conditioning, but they've, they've retracted them and gone along with the line federal. With the federal with line to federal, right, yeah. right. But check your local because I don't keep track of all of them. And, and, right. You know, it's your responsibility to know and, your And there may your be additional laws. filing requirements, but definitely you've got to have some disposal and handling requirements. You want to make sure that mm -hmm. you're handling all that correctly. Yep. Okay, well, I've now got a certified tech that is able to actually touch the system. Is it time to work on the car now? It's time to work oh, on the car. Perfect. Yeah, so just like with so this, is, this is a car <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so now we can actually touch the car. So all of this that we've done beforehand is part of that uh, research and discovery process. You and I talked uh, yesterday about um, needing potentially a research technician in the shop full time that just does this stuff. Yeah. Um, all right, so before we go, um, oh, does is, the CPS rep a doing a demo with the CPS machine on a car need to be certified to have a card with him? Well, it absolutely, yeah. should be, yeah, should yeah. Be. That'd be. That's a great question. So make sure that the, yeah. the tech coming in and absolutely. hooking up in your store. So let's make sure all of your people, if they're yeah. not, are certified in the next two yeah, hours. I got my card. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Everybody can show their cards. Okay, so let's start touching the car, guys. Okay. So if I'm going to do this teardown, what's my first step before I can take that condenser out of the car? What are some, what are some of the things I need to do? 
Well, if it's a closed, if, if the system is still closed and it's got refrigerant in it, then right. we gotta get the refrigerant out before we start messing with it, right? So, you, you know, using your certified equipment hookup, remove the refrigerant, and then you can start with the disassembly and capping off of parts and storage, proper storage of parts, et cetera, so. So, so just walk us through real quick with the machine. So, uh, if I was gonna take this machine and hook this up to this car, and, and don't do it, yeah, no. but, you know, uh, what kind of process does that look like? So first of all, I got to find the service port. So um, with R134A and R1234IF cars, they've been making it easier. Back in the R12 days, I mean, good luck. <laughs> uh, we had, um, so the fittings were quarter flare, and this is a true story, because I was in the industry back then uh, in the R12 days. But um, we got many machines in that they hooked up to the fuel rail. Oh, this is the same connector. The fuel injectors? So the tank, the machine yeah. would come in, it was defective. It was full of gas. Oh my but anyways, gosh. so find the, the, find the service. Flammable. So we're past that. Flammable. We're past that. Mildly flammable. <laughs> so find the service port. It's easy to find. Hook up your machine. Just tell it that, hey, I'm gonna, I, I need to get this refrigerant out. I'm going to recover. It, it walks you through the process. So we, we pride ourselves on uh, making machines that guide you through the process. It's kind of like press play and walk away. There you go. OK. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> So it's gonna it's gonna take it's gonna actually evac the whole and entire it's gonna, system. It's, it's gonna, gonna cover what's yep, in there. It's gonna tell you what's um, going on. It's and it's gonna, gonna tell me what it did, right? It's gonna print it's me out a little report. Absolutely. File document. Tell you how much document. how much came out, and, and it's gonna tell you how much oil came out. That's important because however much oil came out, you want to put back in. Same thing when you start removing components, and we can talk about that. Is, is when you remove the components, drain the oil out. Measure how much oil is in the system, so you know what to put back on damaged components. If you're putting the same component back, it's got oil in it. Not a problem, right. But. If the system's been open, I, one of the, I've probably lost a lot of oil. Yes. So I'm going to need to think the about collision. the extra yeah. capacity yes. for that. Yeah, you you definitely lose a, a certain amount of oil mm -hmm. when you have a collision. That refrigerant explodes out of that, you know, out of that hole, and there's oil coming with it. Uh, and so you'll find you'll rec find OE recommendations based on the component how much is typically going to be found in that component, what you should put back in it before right. reassembly. Okay. Usually listed on the compressor. But wait, yeah. is that included? No. Ah. And ah. then the other the other part is is that if you know say that we damage the 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 condenser here and wherever it goes and it's going to blow out because mm -hmm. it's under pressure that oil is going to go everywhere mm -hmm. and so we might have we might find it depending on the damage all over the engine compartment and all that we may have to do some cleaning because mm -hmm. um, yes. it goes everywhere sure. yeah so steam sure. clean engine is an, a, an outrageous charge and it's not included yeah so if we've identified the system is open that's another potential line item possible yeah on my estimate to go from there. Yeah. Yeah. But let's talk about system protection, because I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that as we travel, mm -hmm. right, and we go in and out of shops, and I'm on my way tomorrow to go visit some. So am I. Um, we walk through shops and open lines, open mm -hmm. lines everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah, all these lines. When we take this car apart, we got all these lines. So we're gonna have air conditioning lines. We're gonna have radiator lines. We're gonna have connectors. The, 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 all the connectors. These all need to be capped and protected um, away. So. This right here is the air conditioner. Now, mm -hmm. with the air conditioner, we got the accumulator or receiver dryer, which right. has to be protected from moisture, right? So it doesn't saturate, right? So what would we do to take care of that? So uh, yeah, you're you're going to cap off those using okay. um, oh, how about water balloons? Okay. I mean, so why not tape? Uh, well, tape might ha tape has an adhesive. Okay. So anything that you don't want inside that AC system when you go to recharge, you don't want to use it. And tape doesn't stick very well to oil anyway. Probably not. Right. Probably you know. Not, so. And then what about earplugs? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I that's you know if it's I the, see shops it's the right plug an earplug in and. My yeah. favorite was the shop that was using wine corks. I was like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what? Are you, yeah. What? Yeah. Well, so, you know, and, and water balloons, one size fits all. Yeah. And here's the other thing. And just talking to owners now, so. If somebody's going to take a baggie with a zip tie or tape or that kind of thing, so first of all, you got material and time, but then it's also the time to take it back off. Right. And a water balloon, and it's, make sure it's a water balloon because an air balloon has powder in it, a water balloon doesn't. Little right. trick. Yep. So get different, varying different sizes of water balloons, and then just put them on, and they come back off, and then and they're done. And then one shop that I was working with actually had mm -hmm. different color water balloons for different systems they capped. Right. Nice. So for the AC, it was one color, and brake lines, it was another, and, and all Makes that. Sense. So they could take a picture photographically in that bulletproof file and say, mm -hmm. we did do the disconnection. We know it because it's all color-coded. 
So let's go back to it. If I had a closed system before my teardown, mm -hmm. and I tear it down and leave the lines open, I've now just created an open system. I you actually now need an accumulator and receiver dryer. Right, yep. so now I'm back to the whole time that right car's on. in the shop, it's sucking up moisture into yep. that. Right, that's absolutely Deck right. Mm -hmm. yep. No. Desiccant. 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 Yeah, there you go. <sighs> I am from Arkansas, but I did graduate <laughs> college. Uh, so, you know, that's right. a good thing to do. We're not here to judge. All right. <laughs> <laughs> sure you are. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> not not out. Not. That's why I love this industry. We judge so well. Um, so I've got my parts out and I've got them protected. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm protecting my line, so to speak. You know, if you're gonna, and then also if you're gonna take the uh, accumulator receiver dryer out, and then you're gonna put it on the parts cart, you want to, you know, take a plastic bag or you know, Ziploc and get it in there so it's airtight, watertight, so it doesn't get saturated sitting right. on the parts cart. Right, that thing's absorbing moisture without the system running, exactly. so you've got to seal it off for the entire time that you're gonna have that yep. repair and, and protect that. Now, you guys have made a great checklist. Um, for for the shops the out GPS. there, for the technicians, it's also great for the estimators to keep for reference as well. It's a good talking point for adjusters during the negotiation processes when you add those extra right. line items. And they're like, "What'd you pay me for that for?" Right? Um, now, this form, you can see it on the screen there. Um, go through the checklist that they have. Um, will be available for download when the show posts up to YouTube. Um, so as soon as we get the show onto YouTube later this afternoon, there'll be a link there. You can go click and download this form from CPS. You can laminate it. You can tape it to the wall where you're doing AC service. You can hand it to every technician, uh, laminate it, punch a hole in it, put a key ring through it, make them hang it from their um, toolbox along with any other SOPs maybe that you've invented or created for your shop to have. Um, but it's just a great form. Keep it. Um, I, love, I love references. Um, and honestly, adjusters love them too. Something that they can take a picture of and hold makes them feel a lot better. Um, there you go. And then, Mark, we talked a little bit about parts storage. We're going to yep. put those parts on the rack. We're going to seal them up and we're going to send them off with yeah. everything else. And then right? also, we talked about bent lines earlier, you know, in the collision. But now that we're storing lines, those can bend as well if you start putting parts and stuff on top of them. So we want to protect them so they don't bend, because if they bend, you've got to replace them. You're right. not straightening them. So you shouldn't right. fold them in half to store them in no. a smaller space? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me roll this up. Uh -oh. yeah. but if see if I can wrap it around the tape thing. Ooh, <laughs> we could come up with a line thing, right? Yeah, the line thing. Ah, yeah. Tim, we got new ideas for you, brother. You should be here for every show. Okay, so the hot topic everywhere we go these days is repair versus replace, right? Mm -hmm. So. What can I or can't I repair in an AC system? Because I used to go out on hailstorms in every car, 0.5 comb fence. Yeah, I, yep. I, I, I kind of follow the rule that I said earlier. If it, just, if, if it, if it wasn't designed that way, if, the, if, you, if you look at this condenser, it wasn't designed that way. So I think I better replace that. There's no, no. way I'm going to repair that. It, it, if a tube is bent, absolutely. Anything that restricts the Any wall, restriction. Any restriction. Is there. But we can yeah. comb the fins. Potential. Yeah, you can. Yeah. You can actually yeah, comb yeah, the yeah. fins and make them look yeah. a little better. Now, the concern, though, in repairing is after people comb the fins, they say, okay, now it kind of looks a little bad. I'm going to paint it. <laughs> so they walk over to their toolbox and they grab their rattle can of black paint or whatever, and they start shooting paint on there. Now, here's the problem. This is a heat exchanger, right? And if we put a coating on it, it may not exchange heat the way it's supposed to. So we got to be careful with capacity, that. Right. And we, you know, in just a moment, we're going to talk about aftermarket parts in the same vein. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you and I are going to talk about that. We're going to yeah. let everybody else out of that discussion. <laughs> so fins, maybe. Yeah. But if I've got any dentations, any abnormalities within the tubes, I'm going to buy that condenser. Yep. Right. Yep. Any any damage, any breaks along the sides to wherever any yep. of the storage containers or that, that dryer yeah. on now, there. Now, if we have a one of these and, and the structure shifted and the mounting tab or something's a little bit bent or, you know, maybe it's plastic, we can, you know, re repair a right. small little break. Those kinds of repairs are fine, generally speaking. But when we start getting into the actual system, it's a pressurized system, other than like comb and fins, we pretty much aren't doing anything. Yeah, this thing isn't just statically holding fluid. There's a lot right. of pressure running through there, yep. right? Yep. So we want to be careful. Now, Mark, you and I are going to have a conversation because we're going to let okay. some people out the hook on this. Yep. Um, <laughs> these, these components, oh, cooling, yeah. right? Yep. Condensers are one of the most commonly aftermarket Mm -hmm. estimated things yep. in our industry, right? What's the harm in that? It's just, it's, you know, come on. It's just a condenser. Well, there's a few concerns. And we're not, and I'm not here today to say anything that aftermarket parts are, are, are bad. However, there's some concerns. Like when we start looking at, the, at these different parts, there's a, there's a certain amount of rows, a certain amount of spacing, a certain amount of material. 
And some of the aftermarket stuff that I've seen where the, the factory one's not painted and the aftermarket one is. Well, doesn't that paint act as an insulator and won't allow for heat exchange, et cetera? And so what happens is, is that we can have a condenser that doesn't exchange the way it's supposed to. Therefore, the compressor's gonna run longer. That can uh, produce improper wear and tear on the compressor, but more importantly, gas mileage. So there's some issues that we gotta look at. So if we we're ever gonna get an aftermarket one, we wanna make sure, count the rows, make sure we got exactly everything that is identical to the way it is. And same thing with the radiator, which we're gonna talk about. Right. So, so those are concerns. Yeah, so here's the thing to think about is that, I can hear many people now going, but wait, there's a law that says it can't void a warranty, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. you're correct. There is a law yeah. that says that I can't void the warranty mm -hmm. on the car because you've installed an aftermarket condenser. So the cooling system itself may technically stay under warranty, but if the aftermarket part is the cause of the system failure, yep. then that is not a warrantable loss to the, to the machine. Plus, I don't want to do anything to the car that's going to cause my customer to lose life expectancy on other parts of the vehicle. Yep. Um, so right now, I would really love air in this building, and I bet our customers driving around right now would really love air in their cars. Uh -huh. So just some things to think about. The part may be fine. It might be fine. But yeah. you're definitely going to want to get it you in You have to inspect it and look at it. Right. And as an appraiser, I want to put the best product possible on my customer's mm -hmm. car. I'm not just looking to get out cheaply. And so if it's not the same, well, then it's just not the it's same. It's not the same. Yep. And we're going to move on from that. So let's talk about the estimating. Mm -hmm. So obviously, I always tell everybody to refer to the DEG. Danny does a fantastic job of answering any questions. But when it comes to estimating AC systems, there are a few additional line items that I'm going to have on this. So in addition to replacing the condenser, yeah. Right. So recovery, that initial hookup and recovery, when it comes in and it's in my blueprinting bay, not, not included. included. Right. Um, evac and, and and not every car needs it because right. if it comes in not full that's why it's not included because they can't have it blanket for everything right um, evac and recharge um, is technically not included even though the estimating systems have an ability for you to click an extra line yeah. that says evac recharge 1.4 right yeah. and so we got to remember though if it's full we got to recover do what are all the repairs and then when we're all back together then we got to evac, which basically create a, uh, a vacuum on there, mm -hmm. and then put it in. So it's actually, it's not evacuate and recharge, it's recover on a full system, then when we're all done putting the car together, then it's evacuate and recharge. Right, so we've got additional charge there. If you are using the, the 1.4 or whatever your estimating system is standard with, um, that's good, but just keep in mind that that's, there's not included there. Yep. Um, to replace the dryer or to R and I the dryer to protect it during the repair, not included. Not included. Um, and the time for the condenser. Uh, leak test, it's not included. And after you, and, and here's the thing, just because you snapped it together, doesn't mean you're okay. You put it together, you recharge it, you get it up to operational temperature, and then you leak check. Right. So that's labor and time. Yeah. Um, materials, so none of the materials I'm using are, in, are included in any of those fees. So I've got an additional line item for my refrigerant and I've got additional light items for the oil that I'm going to be using. And one thing about it, the oil is hazardous waste. Yes. And you can't just dump it in your thinner barrel. It's a separate hazardous waste stream that has to get, be gotten rid of. Right. So if you take a car, it's got a, you know, a few ounces that's going on that you know, comes out in the bottle, you can right. tell how much it is and then figure out what your waste stream is, that might be an additional charge too. Right, and it's not just one line hazardous waste $10. Right. Doesn't catch it all there. Different waste so. stream. Um, I can line out and mount those hazardous waste fees. Mm -hmm. um, protection of the system. So Cover my covering, covering yeah. sealing, labeling, any of that, not covered. But right. it has to be done, right? Yep, not, not included. Not included. You said not covered. Oh, it's oh, that's see, that's my insurance day. That's not covered, Mark. <laughs> I'm not paying for that. You're the only one asking for that. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. I got, um, I got a bag of balloons. Clean up. So we talked about when the system. When the oil blows off. Yeah. You may have to do some clean clean. Yeah. Wipe down, you got some cleaning that you've got to do to that, and that's not included, not included. either. Yeah. That's also not part of my four car washes during the repair process. So if you've watched our um, other estimating videos, we, there's four times in the, in the cycle of repair that I'm going to wash the car. This is not an included operation in any of those washes. So it's a definitely an additional and It's on fee. a case-by-case -case basis, because not every car is going to need that. Right, no. Yeah. Uh, but if I come in and I, I do my UV test or I see it and I know it's there, yeah. well, i got to clean it up. I can't give that mess back to the customer, right? Yeah, and it doesn't show up on the camera, but if we actually took the UV light and put it, there's a little bit of, of uh, where some of the Freons come out of here. 
or not Freon, sorry, refrigerant. That's actually right there with the dye. You're gonna have me. I'm gonna oh learn to say desiccant. That's it, right? Say refrigerant. Oh my god! <laughs> so I'm gonna learn to say desiccant. You're gonna learn to say refrigerant. Icar's yeah. here to train, <laughs> and we got you saying desiccant. Look, I can make an Icar testimonial video now. <laughs> I didn't know how to say it before the show, but thanks to Icar, no, I, I do. can now. <laughs> You're just gonna say it's that stuff that says "do not eat" uh -huh. <laughs> on the little packet when you Sell buy a camera. camera. Mildly yeah. flammable. Yeah. My only fire, do not eat. Yeah, all oh, the Tide Pods, don't eat it. Don't yeah. eat it. Yeah, don't Looks eat Looks like either. rock salt, though. It kind of does. Yeah, just saying. <laughs> all right, anyway, okay. All right, so. Looks like that stuff you can put on top of a bagel. The squirrel. Yeah. A bagel? <laughs> bagel. This is, this is why you come to the live show, for the yeah. fun that we have, yeah. right? Yeah. Number seven, please. You guys yeah. have no idea. <laughs> what's, what's, that's an inside bagel. joke, just yeah. in case. All right, guys, all right, so I'll have we successfully one. covered air conditioning? Condensers, well, we, AC. You know, but here's the thing. We could talk for the next 48 oh, yeah. hours on it. But for the purpose you of can. this show, <laughs> well, that's what, kind of what yeah, we wanted to I, I did want to mention one more thing, and that yeah, is a refrigerant it. oil. We just mentioned yeah. it as a disposable, but there is a difference between uh, oils used in R1234 YF vehicles and R134A vehicles. Please do not use your R134A oil that you've been using for the last 10 years in a YF vehicle. The YF vehicle won't last long if you put that oil back in the system. So you have to use an oil that's compatible with uh, R1234YF um, in the system. And CPS actually came out with a single oil for both R1234YF and 134A. So it's backward compatible. So you only about, need and one And what oil. about hybrid? Because that's a different oil too. Uh, and hybrids. Uh, <laughs> very good question. Awesome. So yeah, thanks for being my straight man. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> all good. So and be, sure, be sure you inject the right amount of oil, what you took out of the system, what you measured to coming out of the system. And you know, use if you're if you're if you're refilling the entire system, use the factory oil, whatever the factory called for. If you're doing it as a top off, as to the minimum amount you lost, you'll use you know this right. oil. Yeah, one thing point. I just want to put a clarification in. So a hybrid vehicle takes a different oil. The right. reason why it takes a different oil is because it doesn't conduct electricity as it goes through the system. If you put the wrong oil into a hybrid system. You can cause a, a no start. Yeah, condition. the car won't start. You're going, wow, we didn't, yep. all we did was recharge the AC, car yep. won't start. Right. Right. That happened a lot in the early years of the Prius. Absolutely. We would get calls yep. from shops going, wait, what's the deal? The car won't start. And then that was what it ended right. up being. Yeah. So I think a lot of us learned that pain point early on. Well, guys, are we ready to go to engine cooling? Well, let's talk about cooling. Let's, let's yeah. do it. Bam, here we go. So typical engine cooling system, but you, there are technically two on the road. What are those two systems? Expansion and overflow. Overflow, however, is the older, I'm going to call it more dated component My of the car park. My 76 Suburban has one. Come on. Yeah. Again, more older, right? <laughs> so it's getting a little long in the tooth. Yeah. And, uh, that's and that's just a very good Arkansas say. See, I, I did that see? for you. Yeah, I, so I pulled proud. that out just for you. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have you eat squirrel for yeah, you. Yeah, that's why I said tooth. <laughs> yeah. Possibly. And, uh, and so um, that the overflow system isn't sealed. The overflow container is just for what comes out of the radiator at the time of expansion. An okay. expansion tank, like what's in this vehicle, so the expansion tank there in the back, is a sealed system all the way through to that tank. So that's actually the pressure cap that's there on that tank. And actually under pressure. Yeah. Under pressure. So you notice on the radiator here, you can't see it, but there's no cap on the radiator. The cap is here. That's correct. So you just don't want to go just unscrewing that, you know, just. Yeah, I mean, no, not when it's under Contents pressure. Now, the other pressure. part of it is, because repair versus replace from the estimating aspect becomes a concern there. Because if, you know, an overflow bottle or something, no pressure on it, you, a lot of repair stuff you can do, welding or that kind of thing. But when you deal with an expansion tank under pressure, whole different conversation. Yeah. I suddenly have that Queen song in my head. Under, under pressure. pressure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So now you're hearing it too, right? Yeah. A little bit yeah. of vanilla ice yeah, mixed in yeah, there. Yeah. Didn't you? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so, what are the common components that are damaged in the engine cooling system in a front end collision? Radiator. This is the question hoses. and answer portion oh, yeah. of the day, boys. <laughs> Radiator, yeah. hoses, fans, those are the big ones. Yeah. Yeah. Water pump, perhaps, depending on the location of the pump and how much damage was sustained. Water right. pump may very well be involved. So, there's the fins, and then also a lot of the radiators have a internal transmission cooler as well. So we might That's have right. transmission cooling lines going to the radiator. Some are Absolutely. separate. Right. But you know, all things to all, all things to be considered there. 
Yeah, I saw a post online the other night from a shop that obviously had done the tear down, but not capped anything off and didn't take the battery out. And oh, yeah. The cleanup tech comes in the next day, tries to start the car and moves it and transmission fluid blows everywhere. Now, if they had balloons on those, the balloons would have just blow <laughs> off. Expanded. They would have just expanded with right. transmission fluid. <laughs> or take yeah. the battery out. I yeah. mean, that's, that's you know, yeah. the, the one there. Well, on that um, car, they had do not drive on the windshield. And the guy drove it. So <laughs> we've discovered it with cleanup. all of our shows last year and this year, Mark, that technicians have an issue with reading. Sometimes, yeah. So um, color well, coding. Then I drive it very far. Yeah. Well, it's just backing it out. Yeah, it's yeah. a big deal. Just turn, turn it on. Right. So there are four types of coolant technologies, right? So just like with At least. my AC. I have got to identify first step in estimating, besides I know I'm going to replace that, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm just going to R and I it to do a core support or an, a rail or an apron or whatever. Um, I've got to identify what coolant's in there. But there's more than four. This is four major ones. Right? Well, there's four, four major that I'm categories. gonna deal with. I think, I think, last four I, major I think there was 18, 10 years ago when I looked at how many yeah. different things, variations you could buy. Right. Yeah. But I've got these four now. What what are the four? How does the shop know? Is it a sticker identification? Is it the OE procedures the, to find? The, yes, the, go to the OE documentation. Go find out what coolant is installed and use that coolant. I, just keep yourself out of trouble and use that coolant. Now, when an OE says I need a particular type of coolant, is that just a, an attempt to sell a part, Josh? No, or is there a specific no, reason that coolant needs to be It's based on cooling properties. It's based on how it interacts with the metals used in that system. Aluminum blocks with Coolant does so much problem. more than cool, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, there's there's lubrication that occurs. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's both cooling and lubricating different moving parts within that system. Right. So and if it's a BMW and I get like a bill for maybe $300 worth of coolant, BMW specific coolant, yeah. I can't just say, well, why didn't you go get some Preston and put it in there? Right? Right. There's some yeah. reason. You know, another thing we see is that you'll open up the system and it's supposed to be a, like, a, like in a Toyota, like the Toyota Long Life, which is red, mm -hmm. but there's green in there. So obviously somebody has been dumping in a different coolant and a lot sure. of times don't, those don't even mix. So that can create some problems. Now, what do I do? Flush the Got entire flush the system. system. Yep. Yeah. Right. Get everything out and re and reinstall. So that maybe an additional line item on the estimate. Something to think about that I've yeah. got to put in there. Yep. All right. So again, I got some laws to think about here. Correct, guys. So OSHA is considering. I don't have a lung issue when it comes to coolant, right? But I definitely have an eyes and hands. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely have a spill potential with this. Well, because, and heat yeah. could be hot. Yeah. Possibly. So I've got some rules there for OSHA to do. And then the EPA gets me on storage and disposal. Correct. And I can't just put coolant in any container either, can I? No, this is another hazardous waste stream. Yeah. So as a shop, another I may have three coolant. or four barrels out behind the shop yeah. that's for different things. And I'm it's actually more than that, but yeah. Yeah. I like and, a whole row of them. Better. And again, you need to check with both federal and local uh, authorities about what, the, what that waste stream is and how it should be handled. Yeah. in your area. So you mean to tell me if I drain the radiator into a pan and then I take the radiator, I just don't dump the coolant back in into a <laughs> into a galvanized pan? Yeah, no. I yeah, because the galvanizing will actually, yeah. that's what most of them are. A lot of them are galvanized. Yeah, it actually, the galvanizing will destroy the coolant. And you don't know if the cat you know, used it as a facility. You don't know. <laughs> and what was right. and what was the last thing that was in that pan? And did you clean it out correctly? Yeah. And yeah. Transmission. Fluid. Right. So right. a lot of things to think about. You're always starting over. Um, with the fluids that are going back in and after mm -hmm. after the repair. But now I don't have any law that's preventing my technician, my teardown tech, my reassembly tech from touching or messing with radiators. At this point, no. Yeah, so nothing special there, so to speak. No, right. no online certification. No online certification needed. Mm -hmm. So repair, Are, can I, so we found some really awesome videos online. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, of radiator repair. And we know as severity continues to rise, more people are searching for repair versus replace options, so to speak. Um, what are my repair opportunities to the engine cooling system? You mean the correct ones or the YouTube ones? Let's talk about the correct ones. Oh, okay. The YouTube ones are fun. Just go at your leisure. Oh and, yeah. Let's know. start with a safe one. You can comb the fins. Yeah. You've got fins that are bent over. Uh, you can potentially straighten those fins. But that's, that's there's a concern because most people want to rattle can some color on to make it look like it wasn't repaired. Correct. We got a we got a heat transfer concern. Right. In that. So we're back to that issue. Yep. Um, so I can't paint it, right? I can maybe do some minor. If I've got any sorts of tube bins, anything, can I just straighten that out? Well, on a can radiator, I put it on the ground on a radiator generally, 
Yeah, if the, if the tubes are bent, you're generally not going to. Yeah. Now, in some cases, you might recore it, which is just taking the tanks off, putting a core in, and then putting it back together. And a lot of radiator shops will do that. That is technically an aftermarket, though. So we'd have to look at and make sure we got the same number of fins. But generally, we don't have like a line issue because the, the, the radiator tubes, are, they're, they're rubber. They're designed to move a little bit. But what's not is the transmission cooling lines. So when the whole thing moves, we might have a restriction in those as well. Mm -hmm. So right. there's a concern there. So we're not going to repair the transmission line. If we bend a, uh, uh, a radiator line, it's generally not an issue. Right. So let's talk about plastic repair, because I, I don't see a whole lot of plastic repair hitting into the AC, into the condenser unit. But when we get into radiator and cooling, engine cooling, I start seeing plastic repair being mentioned a lot. What are some of the concerns to think about there? Well, if you're going to repair something that's plastic, and, and again, if you take a radiator, a little mounting tab or something like that, plastic repair on that is probably not going to be an issue. The problem that we have is anything under pressure. Back to the Queen song. Mm -hmm. So anything under pressure, would you want your plastic repair to be able to try and withstand you know, the pressure that gets created in, an, in, in, a, in a cooling PSI, system? Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of pressure there. And the next thing you know, and the whole hot. thing blows apart. And, that, and, and your pl a plastic repair, you know, like a plastic weld or something like that, like a lot, of, a lot of companies do, it's fine from a cosmetic standpoint, want to repair a little tab or you know, something small plastic. But repairing something that's under pressure, we don't want to do that. That's just liability, I don't just want to assume, right? Yeah. That leaves the customer stranded on the side of the road or potentially mm -hmm. damages an engine that I'm now replacing. Yep, absolutely. Um, but as we can see on that tank, I mean, I've got a couple of mounting bolts yeah, there. Right here or something. Sure, if that breaks off, okay. Because the worst yeah. case scenario if plastic repair fails is where now the customer brings it back yep. and I've got to buy a, a new tank yep. and say, I'm sorry, my repair failed. But if I've got a crack in that actual tank it's on. It's or over. the holding tank on the side of the radiator yep. or any of that, that's just... It's done. That's just, I don't want to... I don't want to bite that bullet. No. I don't want to have that on my conscience or, right. or have that long-term bill for that. There are, yeah. there are some great applications of plastic repair. That's not I don't one think of them. we have to go too, too far and try to repair <laughs> everything that comes in that's got a piece of plastic. Yeah, on, and, right? they, and, and you go on YouTube and you see videos of people doing exactly that, but right. don't do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then keep in mind, for me, I always say keep in mind visibility, right? Mm -hmm. that, that car looks a certain way before the accident. Customer deserves for it to have that same aesthetic appearance. If it's something that that customers never going to see, but in this bottle, I see those mounting. You're going to see it, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, just you know, well, the mounting, the mounting one on the very underside, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So the repair is over, right? Or I have um, um, completed the car. I'm ready to put it back together. What are some considerations for putting a radiator back into a car and getting this thing going? There, there's a big one with air pockets. You've got a cooling system that needs to be full of nothing but coolant. And any air anywhere in the engine or in that system as an air pocket, if you don't refill it correctly, uh, then you've got air in there and that air will end up with a hot spot. You can, you can damage the engine very quickly. All right, now you guys make more than just AC tools for our technicians. You've got a tool for that? We got a tool we for that. We do, CPS manufactures a, uh, a tool by the name of the airlift and the airlift will refill the coolant system in seconds without any air trapped in air locks, any air trapped in the system. The other uh, function that it'll perform, it'll perform a leak test to make sure that, uh, that the, the uh, repair has been completed and there's no leak anywhere in the coolant system prior to refilling it with uh, coolant. So for the technician, I mean, it's a simple hookup and I'm actually refilled the system. I know I'm air free and now I know I'm leak free too. It's air operated and air free. Perfect. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and OEM approved. And OEM approved. I'll, you know oh, yeah. how I feel I mean, about I, OEM. Well, I just remember back in the days, I think it was Chrysler, they had the little screw on top of the engine here. So you had to put the car up on jack stands at 20 degrees and run the engine and yep. unscrew it until water. It, remember exactly. those days? Exactly. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, well, so this Ford, kind of, Ford had those as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're still there. Now, what's a tool like that going to run a tech? Uh, a couple hundred dollars. So makes my whole life a, a lot easier and prevents a lot of comebacks. I've, mm -hmm. I've spent. Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks lately looking at comebacks around cooling systems um, and that is a really guaranteed way to upset your customer right because <laughs> now they're not going to trust anything Absolutely. else that you've done to the car oh, you're talking about an engine yeah, yeah. Uh, you didn't that's refill a, the engine right that's that's a big that's a big expense yeah right uh, and that's just a trust factor right I, it's okay if they have to come back and go hey i think there's a little chip on the paint here but you know well, they, well last well, week toes back in on the rollback well, well, last week we're talking about you know making sure we get everything back together so there was a fender that was replaced on a subaru and they had the ground coming off of the cooling fan that actually went mm -hmm. under 
the bolt for the fender. So they put the fender, they unloosened it up, put the fender on, the tech didn't get that properly seated. Cooling fan didn't work. Shop got to buy a brand new engine on a Subaru. Right. So my teardown process of labeling everything Absolutely. and documenting it would have come in really handy. Really handy right though. there. Mark, we can't go too much further without you and I talking about, remember this is you and I, right? Yep. So we're going to give everybody else a break. Um, this is another component that I see frequently replaced mm -hmm. aftermarket. Absolutely. Uh, because let's, you know, let's face it, the common repair issues, customers go to Napa and AutoZone and sure. O'Reilly's and they buy radiators. Mm -hmm. What's our concern as collision repairs with those aftermarket parts? It's the same concern that we had with the condensers. It's, first of all, how many rows are in there? Do we have the coolant transfer efficiency? Uh, you know, a lot of them we see where they'll, they'll sell it and it'll bolt in, but there's, you know, the OE's got three rows and this one's got two. Well, clearly we're not going to have the, the, tr the cooling transfer efficiency that that had. So if you're going to use the aftermarket, get them side by side, make sure that they're, they're matching. You know, if the OE has no paint on it, it's just, you know, got an aluminum shell and this one's painted with a really nice shiny black, might want to have a transfer efficiency concern there. Just, you know, look it over and be careful. Right. So to keep in mind here, and again, so this is my opinion, right? And I don't want anybody to transfer that opinion to anybody else. After all of my years since 1995, which I guess isn't a lot of years, but it's enough, right? We'll take it here. <laughs> the OE designs components to work within a system, right? So nothing in the OE world is designed alone or standalone or on its own. In the aftermarket environment, you hear the term re-engineering a lot, where they take a single part and attempt to re-engineer it. But in that re-engineering process, it isn't designed to work within the system. They're simply trying to copy a component to look similar, to do a similar function, but then they don't put that component into that system and test it to see how it reacts with everything else. To me, I don't want to have an engine issue come back. I don't want a customer upset. I don't want to have a part that I install cause a failure to the system later. We've had a lot of shops mm -hmm. that have written in over the years that says, hey, I installed this particular aftermarket component and the customer came back about six months later and the engine was blown and the radiator didn't work. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean all parts are bad. There may be some out there that are good. You just need to make sure that you're doing the right thing and comparing those parts when they come in. It's not just a matter of that's all the policy we'll pay for. Um, and I don't think of any single insurance company that would want to install a bad part on a car. They don't want their so, customer on the side of the road. Yeah, they don't want that to happen no, either. Of course so, not. Um, definitely a dialogue system to happen mm -hmm. between the shop and the insurer or the adjuster, appraiser, independent, whoever that would be. Yeah, and you know, and as we move along with the technologies, you know, all these computers and temperatures and different things that are going on, it, it, it makes a difference. And you know, a '76 Suburban with the radiator and you know different things, it. It wasn't as critical of a concern right. as it is now. Oh, absolutely. Right. And you're cooling a lot more things absolutely. with the same radiator. It might be a little larger because they're cooling other modules. They're cooling the alternator. Or, yeah, batteries. Yeah. Uh, Turbo And now, you know, getting a system without air in it is even more critical because if those get damaged, that's even worse. Sure. Yeah, it's a lot going on there. Mm -hmm. But that's a good point about we are cooling a lot more things than we used to. Yeah. 25 years ago, that's cars didn't have TV screens and, and Pandora's radio and all the other things that we like in our convenience. Oh, yeah. But we just, also just see cooling lines going from the radiator to the back of the car to the battery packs and back up too. Yeah. So, you know, and one other side note, I mean, we, we keep calling it, uh, we keep talking about it being a cooling system, but it's also a system to help bring everything up to temperature yep. quickly as well. And you need it to come up to temperature evenly. You know, so if, if you think about fuel economy and how important that is to everyone these days, fuel economy isn't really achieved until you get up to operating operating temperature. And so having the coolant throughout the system is helping to get the system up to temperature in a reasonable amount of time so that you can achieve that fuel economy. Yeah, there's a lot going on in cars these days that aren't just, it's not your brother's Oldsmobile, so nope. to speak. Um, it's not even what your grandfather's Oldsmobile, but it's not even your brother's Oldsmobile no. anymore. No. Um, so there's so many things that the systems are doing beyond what we originally thought they were. And maybe some of us 30 year veterans were trained on 30 years ago. We've got to think of things differently. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the most important part for me, right at the end of the day, pay me, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> And I'm not ashamed of it. So just like we had with our air conditioning, right? We knew that I had to have a certified technician that definitely made it a mechanical operation and therefore should be paid under mechanical labor rate in the estimating system mm -hmm. into the engine cooling system again. And as a specialized trait, it is a mechanical operation. We're going to put that as mechanical rate. Some things that are not included. Um, we, I call it bleed the system, but you guys did a little bit of education on me earlier today that it's a little bit different than bleed. Well, we can bleed and fill at the same time now. Yeah, so we're, we're basically <laughs> but, kind of... But, but to be clear, yeah. 
it is a separate operation that you guys have got a machine that does both. Correct. Right. Yeah, right. just to be clear about that. Yeah. You know, and the other thing is, so Bleed the System, uh, I think it was Mitchell, not included, and right. CCC, it was included. included. So it, you got to watch what those are doing too. Right, and I want to make sure we pay attention to those um, and get those differences. Um, and then pressure test the system, right? So we've got it all back together. We're not just going to assume we did the right thing and it works. We're going to test it. Yeah, and, and the, the cooling system for the engine and all the other stuff is not under pressure until you get it up at temperature. Right. You know, the air conditioning system is got pressure on it. And you got to run it and get the, cold, get the cold air coming through. But the cooling system requires that we get it up to temperature and we're not going to just let it get up to temperature and leave it in the driveway and go, okay, we're good. We actually so, want to get it through the drive cycles to make sure that all the other systems are operating the way so they're wait, supposed to. So wait, you mean I just can't put the car in the stall, turn it on and let it idle to temp? No. I do need to get it on the road? Yep. So in that's a road test? Yeah. And mm. I, remember, we got all these other systems that are relying upon this. It could be, you know, uh, batteries that are in the back for the uh, hybrid systems. It, it, you know, all kinds of stuff. We got to drive the car. And then I got to check it to see if it threw any codes while I was driving the car, right? Absolutely. So, um, so we, we've got on there test drive to temp. We want to make sure that we drive that point home. Mm -hmm. I think shops get to worry about driving customers' cars, mm -hmm. and they think that they don't want to take that liability on. So a lot of shops pass on road tests. And there's a lot of things, even in ADAS, which I can get on the iCar website, that there are some road tests and temp, and I got to get to certain speeds and do some things. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have to get over that fear. We're going to have to start driving cars, mm -hmm. because if I'm not driving them, well, then I'm not really putting them back to where they should. And yep. then now that's the liability as well. So yeah, you might just be swapping liability. Exactly. Yeah. So and, trade and one the, to the other. And let the customer know that you will be taking for a test drive, so they yeah. don't come you know, and you say, really why is want to have that as your standard, standard thing when they sign coming in. We, we may have to test drive. Part your of your authorization it's just repair. Part of it, yeah. Absolutely. And then you want to check with, and we do have a show coming up later in the year I'm pretty excited about. We've got a couple of insurance companies that sell garage keepers liability. They're going to come in and answer every question you've ever had on what's covered, what's not covered. But if you know you're going to start road testing cars, then you probably need to have a talk with your um, agent. Your agent. You may need to decide who can and can't do test drives, right? So some guy that's got 27 speeding tickets, who's, who's probably your best painter, because painters have a lot of <laughs> painters have a lot of issues. And I was a painter, so um, your painter may not be eligible to take a car on a test drive, right? So you're just going to have to figure out who that is in your system. Um, and then we talked about those trans lines, which I think is forgot about. Check and fill. Top off trans. Yeah. Another thing that has to get up to temp. Yeah. To now, check. We, yeah, we got to get up there, and, and the only way you can check the, the fluid level on a, on a transmission is to get it up to temp. And then some cars don't have dipsticks. Correct. So a whole nother process that we have to research. Right. And as yeah. with um, both, uh, a good time to talk about it with cooling and with uh, for AC cooling and with um, engine cooling. As I'm detaching sensors or going through steps of the repair process, for instance, if it's battery disconnect or whatever. I may have triggered a whole lot of scanning, diagnostic, and calibration requirements that now have to be addressed. Yep. Um, so we definitely, that's that rabbit hole that we start down and we think I'm just a taking a condenser show. out. What the hell could go wrong with that, right? And yep. then we find 27 things in the OE procedures mm -hmm. that I now have to do, including, interesting, an alignment. Yep. So there are a couple of OEs where you start messing hey, with that system. I remember that show. And I'm now aligning, right? <laughs> yep. So things that we didn't think about. Guys, what have I not covered? What have we not discussed? Um, no more new questions coming don't, in. Don't get me going, because we could be here so, forever, so. <laughs> we're good. I, we're I, good. I think we've covered it. Yeah. We did it good, and yeah. we did it right at, I said you we know, were about an hour time. And, right? and, our, and our whole okay. knowledge base Hopefully of everybody was, out there agrees. <laughs> you know, this was just, you know, to quote Mike Anderson, you know, you don't know what you don't know, and hopefully we brought some things to the forefront here That's that you didn't you, know Mark. you didn't. You I know. You said that first at a Verifex symposium like did, 10 years ago. I did 15 years ago. Yeah. However, Mike took it and ran with it. So we'll give Mike credit. Okay. Because I stole it too, so it's no big okay. deal. Um, but at the end of the day, this is just to bring awareness and this takes research and training and, and, and looking at what's really actually going on with the car. Back to research, start at the RTS website, go to the OEM, then we can start to look at the car. Right. I don't think in, in my entire career, either on both sides of the fence, I've ever met an adjuster that intentionally writes a bad estimate mm -hmm. or a technician that intentionally wrongly repairs a car. It is, you just don't know what you don't know. Yeah. You're, you're scooting along day by day. You're continuing to do the same thing you did yesterday. Um, and then the car changes on you. Yep. So it, mm -hmm. that's why every day, we start every day where, Mark? 
RTS. We start every day on the RTS I portal. Car RTS. Looking for any of those fantastic articles you're writing for me. <laughs> and you'll notice that uh, Scott's picture is prominently in the lower left-hand corner of there. Yep. And if you do, if you do the Ask iCar, you're probably going to talk to Scott. Yeah. Or, or Danielle one of his or people. Susan. Or Daniel yeah. or Susan. Yeah. So what you were telling me the other day, so Susan was with me at the Win Conference. Yep. Right, and people were calling in and going, I don't want to talk to you, I want to talk to Susan. Yeah, they said, uh, well, when's Susan coming back? Where's well, Susan? Well, Danielle's there too, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was with me at the yeah, they, uh, yeah, they were not too happy that Susan was let out of the building to go to win because they wanted her to answer their questions because I was no longer good enough, so. Yeah, well, she, <laughs> her and Danielle are like my, my yeah. Google yeah. of automotive. I don't think there's a question those two girls can't answer. Um, I think, you know, we see Jason a lot. We see a lot more other people uh, from the iCar events. But just a shout out, Danielle and, and Susan. I don't think the industry functions without you. So I'm probably going to get We some, love you. Yeah. I'll probably get some calls from some of the folks in uh, um, uh, Chicago going, hey, don't tell them, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, we know that you do all the work. These guys don't. Yeah. So uh, we appreciate what you do. CPS, guys, thanks for joining You're us. Thanks, thanks for having us. The solutions Thank that you. you guys have Thank for you. shops. Um, shops that want to know more about the products that were in the show today and what we talked about, where do they go? CPSproducts.com. Well, yeah, good place to start. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then there are local distributors throughout the United sure. States that kind of service and sell those yep. products for you. Sales reps, yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. And yep. I can get all that information on the website as well. Correct. Right, so you can just go to CPSproducts.com, look for anything that we had in the show today. I'll also get you a link to whoever the distributor is in your area. Give them a call um, if you are considering um, adding blueprinting and teardown to your facility. Well, you're going to need a machine up front, and they make a machine that will do both systems. So as the industry evolves over the next 10 years, um, as you have to go from 134A to YF, then you'll have one machine does it all, and it'll save you from having to buy two mm -hmm. up there. So we like it a lot. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions, the texting will shut down after the live show. Um, we will probably check that maybe once a week just to see what's out there. Uh, but you can send us questions into the website. You can also put questions and comments onto the YouTube page or on the Facebook below. We will try to get to those as soon as the show is over. We appreciate your time, and we will see you next month on Repair University Live. Thank you. Thanks Thank all. you. Thank you.